It's a beautiful spring come summer evening. Uh, the world is good. The sun is shining. And it's time for the Mastering Portrait Photography Podcast. One of the great things about this podcast is I get to talk to the people who I genuinely like, I'm genuinely interested in, and I'm genuinely inspired by. And this week's guest is absolutely no exception. Many of you will already know him. He's a great of the UK industry. Uh, and it is my pleasure to have spent an hour talking to Mark Seymour, one of the great documentary wedding photographers of our time. Of course, I start by asking him to tell us a little bit about himself his life and his work? Well, I'm definitely old school. I've been around for over 30 years photographing weddings, uh, but I tend uh, more nowadays to do more travel photography and uh, documentary photography. Um, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm going from, or going to, I should say. Um, where, sorry. <laughs> Chat away. You, you chat need away. to cut this bit out and start again. That's all right. I just, I don't, I'll, I don't, I mean, I'll cut bits that don't sound sure. like Sure. Um, I've forgotten the question totally. I've just <laughs> totally screwed up. But And it's, we were just chatting pressure. away normally. But let's just let's ask that question again uh, if you can. Well, just tell oh. us a bit about yourself. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Like, as soon as you put microphones on, yeah, it no. changes the whole tempo of the conversation. I find it quite difficult to talk about myself because I'm, I'm, you know, it's kind of like I like to really be in the shadows most of the time and I'm not. Well, I've, there, but, I've, time, but I've but... seen you present uh, a couple of times and you're a very effective communicator, not just visually, but when you stand up in front of an audience. And, and I've seen you talk about your work, you're eloquent, you're engaging, um, and more importantly, you're interesting. So I don't, I'm not buying that. I think you're very good. <laughs> <laughs> All that's happened is I've stuck a microphone on you Probably and you're finding you it weird. But I think, isn't it easy to talk about something when you're passionate about it? Yes. And I'm passionate about documentary photography. Um, and I find... You know, the more you do documentary photography, the, the, the better you get at it. Uh, your eye gets in it, but also the worse you probably get at portrait and posing photography. And, yes. You know, when it comes to a wedding, after 10 minutes, I'm stuck with the bride and groom. I don't really know what to do with them. Yeah. I've got my few set poses. Um, you know, let me go and meander and talk to people and look for opportunities of layering and... and you know, little things going on or shoot through things. And I'm far more comfortable and I'm looking for those things. And that's kind of what I want to do and want to show people. And I want to talk to people about those and I want to show people or help people um, how to see a layered image or to shoot through or to look for mirrors or look for reflections. Because, you know, although uh, you may be the opposite type of photographer to myself, you still use those elements oh, yeah. within that's your image. Um it's funny, I had a guy um, on one of my courses uh, last year and he said, I've never done street photography before. Um, I've only ever done landscape photography. And I said, well, it's exactly the same. And he says, well, how do you get that? And I said, because look at a layered image. I said, you know, on, on a, uh, a landscape, you've got that big stone in the front, you've got a beautiful view in the background and you've got the trees in the middle and you've just got those layers of things going on. Yeah. And he went, Oh, yeah, he's, I never thought of it like that. <laughs> and I said, the only difference is, is we're putting people in it. Yeah. And mine's moving and it's and it's evolving. And, you know, if, unless you hit it right, you're going to kind of lose that. Uh, but that's kind of the main difference, really. I have to say, you're one of the few photographers that would convert me to do street. I've never done it. I've always been, I suppose I've always been afraid of it. But I don't know why. There's something... You should come on one of our courses. All right. Well, good sell. I'd, I'd love you to. <laughs> hey, no, come and talk to me. All right. You know, um, it, it, I mean, I'm not trying to sell the courses, but it's amazing when people come on them. And one of the biggest questions we get up front is, why should I come on a course or why should I come to Indy with you um, and pay you when I can go there myself and walk around? And yeah, of course you can go and walk around that, but we're not going to sit down with you every evening and critique your work. You're not going to get um, a situation where you're going to places off the beaten track that are known to to be yeah. safe and um, known to sort of produce photographs all the time. And also you're, you're mixing with four or five like-minded people yeah. and you're having a great time. And it's not just 
um, a photography workshop. It's almost like an adventure. We, yeah. know, we're going off the beaten track. And it's funny, most people, well, in fact, on every course we do, you've probably got 50% of the people that have been on a previous course. Right. It's quite amazing. Yeah. So you're, So I, I remember seeing you, you presented at, I think it was... It's either LP, it's either London Portrait Group or it's the Master Photographer Association Central Region. It was in the Pinway. Okay. And you were talking about your, you took a trip to the States to spend, I think it was a week, studying and, I mean, it's quite an intense studying of documentary yes. photography. Yeah. Um, you, do you want me to tell you about the course? Yeah, I do. I do. Well, Gosh. not so much the course as what you took from it and how you found it. Um, it's probably in my eyes, one of the hardest courses in the world. Uh, they still run them, I think. Um, it's called Foundation, uh, run by a guy called uh, We. And uh, basically, you know, I booked a trip to go on this course uh, in Dallas. And uh, it was it was expensive. I mean, it was $4,000 eight, nine years ago. Uh, but you have a small team. Um, I had two mentors. Um, not I had, but we had a t- team of five photographers with two mentors. And th- those two mentors um, just happened to be in my team, both Pulitzer Prize winning photographers. So kind of they knew what they were doing. One of them worked for the, the Dallas Tribune, one for the New York Times. So they, they yeah. knew what, and you couldn't really pull one over them. They knew what they were uh, doing. So I took my trip over there. And bear in mind the 4,000 is plus flights, plus accommodation, plus car hire etc etc and your time and we got over there and um, we uh, had a normal day the first day where you know you're just in a classroom with 20 30 other photographers listening to the tutors telling you about you know their experiences and giving you inspiration like any other normal type of seminar in a classroom that finished from about mid, sorry, about five o'clock in the evening, and uh, then we were split into our groups of five, and us particular five were um, taken to um, a carnival, uh, which in America is the same as a fun fair, run by um, uh, local gypsies um, and uh, Mexican gypsies, and we were told we've got an hour to um, get some photographs, and we want you to take five photographs, um, two portraits, two scenes, one scene setting, and two detail shots. Uh, you can only shoot JPEG, and you're not allowed to delete anything, and you're not allowed to edit them in Photoshop. When you come back, we want to see all your photographs. And you think, wow, that's hard. You know, even if you're walking along and your camera clicks and it takes a picture of the ground, they want to see that. And I think this, I mean, I. I try and run my workshops along the similar basis that I want to see everything that you're taking because there's no point in you showing me your best photograph of me going, brilliant, Paul, well done. I mean, <laughs> in a competition, it works. Yeah. But if you want to improve as a photographer, it doesn't work. And the only way really to see what someone's faults are or what mistakes they're making is to see every wedding they, every pitch they take, yeah. whether it be a wedding or whatever. Yeah. And no point in even selecting down to 50 and you don't need to critique every one of those thousand images or whatever, but you can maybe see patterns happening. You know, someone might be, you know, shooting everything at an angle or they might be, you know, underexposing everything or they might be doing everything from the same point of view all the time. So there's lots of different things you can look at and, and see by seeing the whole set. Anyway, that happened. Um, we went back, we were critiqued in an open forum. Um, and then uh, the sec- second day, I was given my project. In fact, I was given it at one o'clock in the morning when I say the second day. And I was told you need to be at Allen, which is a district of Dallas, a bit like Kingston's a district of London, um, fire station. And you need to be there at uh, six in the morning. So five hours later, and it's an hour's drive. Bearing in mind, I'd only flown in from Dallas into (laughs) Dallas the other day. So I was suffering from some jet lag. Um, Anyway, I got there. First day was kind of like, you know, they were they mollycoddled me, mollycoddled me a little bit. Uh, it's like, you know, do you want some pictures of this or should we set this up? And it's like, no, just I need to just capture your life and what's going on. And you know, everyone probably thought or thinks 
God, I'd love to cover a fire station or, you know, there must be, but when you think about it, how many fires are there? Yeah. And they don't actually do a lot. There's a lot of training goes on. There's, you know, they're in the gym a little bit. And um, they did one training exercise on uh, Nintendos. Uh, this wasn't, you know, they, they were in darkened cubicles and um, there was a scene in front with a with, uh, smoke-filled room. So they were trying to simulate that they couldn't see what was going on. Um, and kind of I'm trying to photograph this and there's nothing, no story to tell really. And I've got a few photographs. Um, and then come the end of the evening, um, guests were in Dallas. So um, guess what? We had a barbecue, nice big bit of steak. Um, and we had with it sweet potato uh, filled with marshmallows really weird so guess what i took a photograph of it yeah. and i totally forgot i'd taken this picture because then i go back and give them my memory card of jpegs and they start critiquing them and i'm not a big fan of the critiquing although i kind of knew what to expect from you know previous people that have been on the course but you can only akin it to the way gordon ramsay would yeah. talk to a chef yeah. whose work he doesn't like there was every other word was an f and one of the photographers, Deanne, her name was, um, she was in my personal space. I mean, her nose was literally inches from my nose. And on top of that, you were in a forum with 20 or 30 other photographers. And you're not allowed to answer back. And you know, when someone's critiquing your work, you've kind of got to take it what yeah. it is. It's their opinion. And this went on and on and on. And, you know, Mark, you know, you're not good. Or Mark, you've got some problems here. Mark this. And it just went on and on and on. And uh, at one point she just said, you know, if you were on my newspaper, she goes, you'd be given the written warning by now. You know, she said, you're, you're, you're just afraid as a photographer. She goes, you're too comfortable in your own little zone. You've got a nice little business back home. And uh, really, I mean, she was right. Yeah. I could see she was kind of right. And because then this fateful photograph came up of my dinner <laughs> and she just looked at me and she just said, what the F is that? And because... <laughs> You know, I couldn't say it's my dinner. And she said, you really just don't get this, do you? And she said, where are you? And I said, well, Dallas. She goes, no. She goes, you're in Dallas. She goes, but you're in the buckle of the Bible Belt. She goes, you tell me they didn't say a prayer at lunchtime. And of course they did. Yeah. But I didn't photograph that. I was eating my dinner with the rest <laughs> of them. So, um, you know, it kind of taught me a massive lesson. It's almost like at weddings, you know, yeah. okay, we sit and have our dinner Um but really, you should be going back in that room at points because there is stuff going on as a documentary photographer. Yeah. There's there's little things going on. It might seem insignificant, yeah. but there's a story to tell somewhere. And it's up to you as a photographer to try and find that story. And that was kind of the whole essence of that. The third day was, was a great day. She came out with me a couple of times. In fact, one of the things she did to take me outside my comfort zone is she took um, all of my lenses away from me, apart from... A, I think it was a 14 mil and 105 mil. So that's the two lenses I was left to right. photograph yep. the day. So what she was trying to say to me was, Mark, get up close. Yeah. Because she knew the 105 was was kind of useless, really. Yeah. So um, I did. And uh, now I would preach that. You know, I preach it on my courses, you know, come with a 35 mil lens. And it's surprising by the end of the week, once people get over that, you know, don't take a picture of someone's back. You know, try and, you know, when you're when you're doing documentaries, it's easy to take someone's back or side because you're being sneaky. Yeah. And if I see that straight away, I'd say to you, what are you afraid of? Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, every photograph, doesn't matter, you know, on a documentary level, you should always say, can I see the nose? If you can see the nose, you can see the face or yeah. identify them. And you've been around the front to confront it. Yeah. And you've got the balls to go and do that rather than, be a chicken and do yeah. it from the side or be a chicken and hold the camera down here and be sneaky about what you're doing so you know confront it but once you've got over that you will your photography will go up yeah many levels i think i think that's what i'm afraid of with street i see i think probably that's me um climbing in I, i'm in weddings i'm fine i'll climb it because i've been given permission essentially mm. it went better than i've been told to do it so it's fine i think with street i find it 
really, I don't know what to expect. And I think maybe, maybe it is time for me to come and attend one of your courses. Maybe <laughs> I'll do that. We'll do a podcast from one of your courses. We should do. Come be, do a I'll, podcast I'll out be, there. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, we've had people come out and um, you know, do a video yeah. of us because obviously video looks better on, on websites now. But yeah, you're more than welcome. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm a big fan of um, audio. Don't ask me. I think it's because I quite like the idea. It's something you can put on in the car. Mm. Or something uh, you can put on in the background when you're editing. Mm. Hence, and I've always loved mm. audio. You know, I, I, I was a musician. Crit- so I can I'm... critique your work the same as uh, <laughs> on a Gordon Ramsay level. Ooh, I'm not so certain about that. <laughs> when so we don't... critique work out of interest, you know, we, I think um, it's really important to not just go in at that same level yeah. with everyone because you know we get people who are uh, you know, really keen amateurs on the course, and you get people who are professionals, and you know the the photography level is different, and you can't critique. Um, an amateur the yeah. same way as you can a, a professional so i kind of try and pitch it to the right i just know that way. i have a very thin skin and i cry easily all right just <laughs> just remember I love that it. no I've, <laughs> I've forgotten it already paul <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? i actually judged i judged a competition in one of the camera clubs last year and it's funny you're talking about that and he'd he taken a, a particular shot of uh two walkers asking a lady uh in on the front of a house directions and he shot it on a long lens from across the street and, and ignoring the obvious slight limitation with the image that she, he'd framed it with a tree growing out the top of this poor lady's head. He'd done it from a distance so it didn't feel engaging. There was, you know, and I'd said in the critique, I said, look, you know, this is a nice moment, but you really do, you'd be better off getting, I'd, I'd remember you talking about this, getting a wide angle lens, get in close mm. and be, be part of it, be inside it. And so I'd kind of relayed this. I mean, I'm not a street photographer by any stretch, but I knew what I was looking for. Anyway, he found me in the interval and came and gave me a proper shouting at and told me I was completely wrong. So. No, you, I mean, just look at all the the famous documentary photographers going back to Cartier-Bresson, you know, the yeah. doyen of street photography, yeah. right the way to you know to people like Martin Parr today and you know Trent Park and all those yeah. Magnum guys. What's their favourite lens? Thirty-five millimeter. Yeah. It's because they're close in the action. Yeah. Okay, they've got another lens to give that perspective, but generally, you've got to be close. Um, I think uh, it's an interesting phrase by Robert Kappa, a great war photographer. If your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. Yeah. But it's really interesting because a lot of people think it means with your lens, but it doesn't actually quite mean that really. It means as a person. Yeah. So when you're as a wedding photographer, you're, you've been given permission to go and photograph there because and you're close to that wedding party. And everyone knows you and says, oh, hi, Paul, how are you yeah, doing? Yeah. And you're close to them. And that's the same on the street. You know, if you, if you can, or when you're documenting someone's story, if you can get close to them, you're going to get better pictures, not just with the lens, but yeah. metaphorically as well. It does feel more energetic, I think, when mm. you have, because you get a slight distortion off the 35 mm. and wider, but you, you are also inside it. So you, you tend to feel like if, if there's, I know looking at some of your images, they very often have this feel that there's a circle of people and you're one of the circle. If that makes sense, you know, when I've seen the, the I mean, you've made, you know, the, the images that have imprinted on me are things like, uh, particularly with Jewish weddings, mm. where you've got that, the, the partying and the, the I, I don't know all of the terms for it, but the lifting and chairs and party. Mm. It always feels like you're one of the pairs of hands holding the sheets or holding the chair legs because you get in close. And I love that energy in your mm. images. So when you came back from the this foundation in Dallas, did it immediately transition into your wedding photography? How did you find ways of adapting all of that in? Well, I'd, I'd always been doing documentary photography, but I, I'm, been, I'm self-taught, so I've never really been on a course before this time. So it, it was now a case of where I was looking for things. Um, so previously, I was going out there and just trying to document a wedding and just trying to take pictures of things that are happening. Whereas now I was going and looking for like layering. Yeah. I think it was one of the first times I'd actually taken a proper layered image and I shot through it, the scene happening. So one of the things they, they taught on the course is again, you know, shoot hard, edit hard. You know, this thing about, you know, Cartier Bresson with this decisive moment, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, it's quite, it's a lot of bull around it really because you can't just take one picture and get everything in perfect positions within a layered image if people are moving around. Sometimes you need to shoot maybe 10, 20, 30 images um, and 
you know, work through to get that image that yeah. you actually want. And it's going to be there in the middle, particularly with dancing at a Jewish wedding. You know, yeah. I might take several thousand images, but deliver a couple of hundred because people are waving their hands all over the page. People are opening their mouths, singing along. So there are a lot of really bad images in there. But, you know, you're in there and you're looking for angles and differences. And there's then become some real gems in there that make your sort of kind of work stand out. But yeah, I did, I transferred um, quite quickly uh, into, you know, more hardcore documentary. I, know, I noticed very quickly that um, my portraiture became worse and worse. Oh, really? Um, because, you know, it's like everything. You, know, you do your 10,000 hours at it, you get good. But you don't practice it constantly. Yeah. You, you become stale at it. And I was becoming very stale at, at portraits. I'd probably got five or six what I'd call classic poses I do. Um, but people don't book me for that. They don't look at my website and say, oh, you've got some wow images on there. You know, they look at, oh, I can see, you know, you just blend in and you capture moments. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want. Yeah. don't want anyone posing me on the day. Yeah. So it's like everything, you sh what you show is kind of what you attract. But yeah, I slipped into it pretty quick. No regrets? No, none at all. Um, you know, I love photographing life. Um, and, you know, I think, um, and it's just my personal view. I mean, everyone's got their own view. But I think the minute I start engaging with someone at a bride, I'm altering that. Um, and the best thing to do is just let it happen and let it develop. And think they are there. Um, a lot of a lot of people are afraid um, because they've they've got to control it, and nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you're showing uncontrolled images, that's what you've got to kind of produce. But they're all, they are there. Um, but you've just got to apply the same rules. You know, you've got to have good light still. You know, you've got to shoot where the light is, and you've got to wait. Ultimately, you know, moment trumps everything. You know, yeah. your great moment trumps everything. Yeah. Um, and you've got to wait for those moments or anticipate them. So I'm always looking for kind of um, reactions rather than action. I mean, the action of a bride and groom kissing yeah. is, is a horrible picture. You've yeah. got two faces pressed <laughs> yes. up against each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of photographers say, oh, let's do a kiss. And it's actually not a nice picture. Yeah. But when they pull away, yeah. that's the picture. And it's the same in most things. It's the, um, the reaction is better than the action. Yeah. No, I know, I know exa exactly what you mean. Um, now, you're someone who I've, I mean, I've had the luxury of spending a bit of time with you. And you're someone that has um, spoken openly about the limitations of uh, competitions and documentary photography. Documentary photography and how to assess whether you're looking at good documentary photography. Um, just talk a bit about that. And I'm curious as to whether you think things are improving, I guess. Um, I, th I think things, it depends where, where, where you're entering your images. And um, I think, it, like everything, there's a place to enter certain images and there's a place to enter other images. And I think, um, and I, I guess we're talking about my fellowship with, you know, the MPA and, and etc. And I don't think they were ready for a full documentary panel. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we had some feedback, you know, you're not using the right lens or, you know, there's someone's, you know, head in the background or, and, you know, when you're photographing real life, everything is not perfect and you're looking for moments. And, you know, whilst you can try and construct images, you're looking for images to, and to, to capture, if you like, that moment. And, you know, I don't think, um, you know, they were ready uh, for that at that particular, I think they are now. Yeah. Um, and uh, we put the panel into the SWPP and the Guild and, um, they had a couple of people on there who knew street photography. And, and I don't know what the MPA does at the moment, but I'm guessing you kind of would do the same yeah, now. Yeah. And I think that's the most important thing is to have someone who is aware of what street photography is and, and what to look for. And it's not necessarily looking for the bit of cuff sticking out to the <laughs> correct length or the hand in the right position. Um, you know, because you, you, you don't have that luxury of taking a beautiful bride in a beautiful location um, with beautiful light and taking that image and controlling everything. And I guess that's why if you look at the amount of fellows around, there's more fellows in portrait photography and studio photography than there is in wedding photography. 
And I think I was the, the first person to get it in documentary wedding photography. And that kind of says why, because it's more and more difficult, the less control you have, the more control yeah. you have, you can kind of replicate yeah. it in a studio. Yeah. Okay, you still would have the right people and the right um, lighting, and you've got to know about those things, but um, you've got that control element, which you don't have on the street. Yeah. Well, I'll take that as encouraging that you think it's going in the right direction. I do. I, I really think it is. But, but also, you know, there's, um, there's areas to, you know, there's different groups, you know, for example, like uh, Fearless, um, yeah. which is, again, part of the foundation thing. They run a competition on a quarterly basis. And most of that is unposed. Yeah. Um, and then there's lots of different street photography groups. Um, I mean, in two or three weeks time, there's a thing called the Street Photography Festival in London. And, you know, they've got their competition. And they're the places if you really want to enter street photography, probably enter it because you're going up against other people who are doing the same genre with people who are at the top of that genre judging it. Yeah. So it kind of makes sense. And if you put a portrait in there, they would kind of look at it and they wouldn't realise if it maybe was a, a brilliant photograph. Or they'd just look at it as, well, it's a nice portrait of said person. Yeah. It's almost the almost the reverse of how it's traditionally been. Yeah. In the associations, uh, right? Where are we? Uh, you're still a big Nikon. You're a Nikon ambassador still. Um, yes. Um, it's it's a um, so the Nikon ambassadorship is um, unlike any of the other Nikon ambassadorships in the world. Nikon UK run a two year ambassadorship, so you're a fully fledged ambassador for two years. Uh, and I was uh, one of the first trance of ambassadors, and I was their first wedding wedding um, ambassador. But once you, at that two year period, um, you're still seen as an ambassador, but with, if you like, less benefits. Right. <laughs> um, so if you go to the Nikon page, you'll still see me as an ambassador, and I still shoot Nikon stuff, and I do street photography courses with Nikon, and I've got an excellent relationship with them, and they use my images. But there's just different kind of levels of, of ambassadorship right. within the UK. But you're still hardcore Nikon. Yes, I use Nikon. <laughs> yeah, no, you're a big fan. Yes. And I was looking at your webpage there this morning, and of course it's still got a big old picture of you with a... Was it an FE? Oh, yeah, that. gosh, that's kind of... Um, I do have that as a film camera, but it was kind of like... Just a shot of a pit of me, really. Uh, you know, I haven't used it for a long time. Well, I think it says that it's, it's the difference between the two of, two of us. My my first camera was a Zenith. Oh, well, no, I think mine probably was, <laughs> was as well. I, no, love, I love that actually, camera. No, it wasn't. And I think you got that picture on your notes I saw earlier. There's a picture of me there. Yeah. With with a box brownie. Ah. And people, this is a really interesting image you've got here. And I don't know. If, can you explain it, Paul, for a second? Well, what I'm, what I'm looking at is uh, two small boys. Uh, looking at each other, one of whom is holding what I now know to be a box brownie. which uh, And there's a coincidence here because the first camera I used, and everyone calls it a box brownie, mine wasn't. Mine was it was a Kodak brownie, but it was a, the UK version that was released in the 60s, mm. which is, it wasn't a box brownie. Uh, but it had two mirrors. So <laughs> he held it <laughs> to, to, mm. and he had two different viewfinders. Uh, so I'm looking at these two boys looking at each other and I'm guessing the one on the left holding the camera is you. It is, yeah. Uh, and I'll post it. If you can give me a copy of this picture, I'll post it up on the And that's my brother, with it. Right. And, um, you know, that's the in, that's the time I became interested in photography. So, what, I don't know, it's at four or five years old, probably. Yeah. Um, and my dad had, uh, at that time, a Yashica, and he had his own yeah. dark room. And I just kind of loved it, the, yeah. this, this, the, the magic of seeing these images appear. And so I was given this box brownie. Yeah. And I only found out literally about four or five years ago that it never, ever had film in it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I would just go around and yeah. click, go around and click. Well, what I love about this picture more than anything else is the presence of mind, I'm guessing from the story you've just told your dad, taking the picture of you taking the picture. Because I don't have that. I don't have that sure. history. I, but I did have film in my camera, so I do have the pictures I took, <laughs> some of which actually showed, I guess... You know, if you were going to put a bit of hindsight on it, a little bit of promise. I don't know if it did show any promise, but that's how you translate it. I, well, it is. And the other strange thing is um, this pitch was only given to me, well, it was given to me 15 years ago um, when I went through a divorce and I moved back to mum and dad's whilst we sorted my wife out of the house and yeah. the kids, etc. And up until that point, mum and dad had never seen photography as a job. But all of a sudden they saw these clients coming and my work coming yeah. and 
because I was in their presence in their yeah. house. Yeah. And then she started getting all these photographs <laughs> out. And there was this here, and there was another one, um, which I have as well, probably about two years later, of me standing by the professional photographer at a wedding, taking the picture of the group that he posed. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> You're that annoying kid. Yes, I was probably. He was like, who the hell is... <laughs> <laughs> well, these days, it's not just one one person. It's all of them, all with their iPhones out. And can I, I'd just like to talk about this image as well on the back, really, because... Um, did, did you spot this or did you? Pick yes, it? no, I did. I was, I was I was going through. I was doing my homework, of course. Uh, and where do you go to? You go to the about page on somebody's website. Yes. So this is you uh, with your mum and your three sons and two of your sons' partners. Is my guess from looking at the image? Yes, and it's um, one of two family weddings we had last year. I've got three boys, yeah, and two of them got married last year. So, right. gosh, it was an expensive year last year. <laughs> um, but James uh, said to me. Um, Dad, you know, can you sort my photographer out? And I said, well, I'll do it. I said, but I'll have someone with me and I'll yeah. step in and out. I said, but he said, oh, I said, I want you to be there as a guest and I want you to... And I said, listen, James, I said, I'm really happiest when I've got a camera around and it's kind of like a mask for me and it gives me an excuse to go up and talk to lots of people. And yeah. if I don't do that, I'm kind of shy and I don't yeah. really want to sort of be there. I want to get out, even though yeah. I know people. Yeah. But this lets me do that. And he said, Are you sure? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I was, if you like, the second photographer. Yeah. Having said that, it's funny, but by being the second photographer, I actually had the best view of the wedding because I stood next to the registrar. Yeah. So rather than um, me, uh, I, would have, I would have been on the second row because the, or the best man, the ushers, filled one row up and the bridesmaids yeah. filled the other row up. I'd have been on the second or third row looking over someone's shoulder probably yeah. most of the time. Here I was... And I, and I probably took two pictures during that whole period because I just stood there in utter amazement watching yeah. my son yeah. you know, get married to this girl that he wanted to be with. And, and Emma's, you know, she's just one of these girls. She had this beautiful smile on her face the whole day. But it was really strange being, in it, being there as a guest rather than a photographer, really. Yeah. And how quick the day went. I mean, one minute you're getting yeah. married, then all of a sudden <laughs> it was the speeches. Yeah, wedding time. And wow. it's like, wow, where has this time gone? Yeah. Um, so there was lots of you know things that you can look at now back in a different um, way. I mean, I wrote a very interesting blog. I think it's one of my most popular blogs on, on my website about it. And the, the other thing, and I have a real problem with this, um, a dilemma, because... This is this is a group photograph that Paul's looking at, and it's um, you know my son, his wife, um, it's my mum, um, it's my two boys, and and their partners. And when it came afterwards to printing out photographs, and there's all these documentary photographs, the one I've got printed out is this family group, and it's kind of like I don't want to do these groups. I don't say I don't do them, but I try and limit people yeah. to do them. But they are close family groups. Yeah. But I've, we've got all these lovely, wonderful moments. But I guess they're moments for the bride and groom to make up this lovely album and tell a story of their day. But the one photograph I've had printed is of my family because yeah. we never get together and That's right. dress up like this at any other occasion. Yeah. So, you know, I say to documentary photographers, don't mind doing those groups because those groups a really important yeah. family occasions when those people come together yeah. at one point in time. Yeah, I, I have a similar one at, um, at my sister's wedding where there's a whole gang of us and we, I don't get that chance very often and I'm in it. I, I did the photography mm. for the wedding. A similar story to you. Uh, but I got somebody, I got one of the guests to pick up my camera. I set it and then we set the group and I'm in it and I treasure that picture. It's so not what I would choose to do mm. but it's always what I would choose to remember mm. that all of us together looking mm. happy and mm. smart and smiling. Yeah, and I think that's true of everybody. It's interesting, you just touched on it, that you use the camera, you use the word mask, and I possibly would use the words comfort blanket, but both are appropriate. And do you find it's much, when well, you've said it, you find it's much easier when you've got a camera in your hand? Oh, so much easier. You know, um, people say, oh, you're a confident person, but if you put me in a room of total strangers to go and network, I'd be thinking, where's, when, the, exit? where's the exit? Where's my, how can I get out? Yeah, I'd no, probably I, go, or yeah, I'd yeah, go yeah. and talk to someone I knew and felt comfortable with and stay with that person the whole time. Um, whereas if I got a camera around my neck, 
I've got an excuse to go up and talk to people or you know, people come up to talk to me and it's it's the same out on the street. You know, when you're um, you photograph in particularly places in India or you know, Myanmar, when you go into temples and, you know, it's not pure street. There's, there's a document, there's an element, sorry, an element of travel photography in there and you're staying in a, um, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, I'm looking for the word that um, a... Um, a monk would stay in a, mo a, monastery. a monastery. Yeah. So when you're in a monastery, you know, you, you and you're there for two or three hours, you kind of get to know these people. Yeah. Um, so you know, I've, that mask is the camera is letting me get in there. Whereas um, it's, I wouldn't just walk in those places. But you know, when we're doing the street photography, if I see a front door open in India, I might go and hello, how are you? It's Na different. Namaste. It's funny, isn't it? I, I, I wouldn't have said that about you, but I suppose. Yeah, now putting it all back together, you are quite, you're not, um, you're a very gentle soul, but I've never watched you work, and I'm guessing you're much more, uh, confident is a, is a word, uh, you're much more pushy, I would guess, mm. with a camera. It's, it's um, I, w I would, I don't know if pushy is the right word, Paul, but I, would, I went out, um, a photographer came on my course uh, last year to me and Mark, called Mark Ashworth. Uh, Mark is um, he's a professional portrait photographer, and uh, the first thing he was he was almost like a rabbit in the headlights. He just couldn't get his head around the street, and he kind of froze for the first two or three days, which really surprised me as he was a professional photographer. But the third, fourth day, he sorry, he produced some amazing uh, pictures. Um, but he said to me one evening, he said, "I've been watching you a lot," and he said, "You go in." extremely defensively he said your whole body language and demeanor is so non-threatening he says like you just and I, i'd never noticed it's just like i do um but he said like you 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 walk in almost like slightly bowed over and, and with your hands behind your back and you know hello how are you and you're smiling and nodding like reassuring mm. and he said you're not going in there like with a camera yeah straight in their right. face if you're going into a situation like like a monastery or a synagogue, or yeah. you're going into someone's home, or uh, you know you're going into a market where you're you're going to be for a long time, so it's kind of like, yeah. So it's is it, so it's, it's exactly you. Just you have the confidence to do what yeah. you do. I, th I think that's really interesting. I'm, I need to come on that course. Uh, <laughs> you, you've, you've made the best pitch ever. Uh, so in this wonderful um, industry of ours. What is it about the industry that makes you want to shout and be angry? There's got to be something in this wonderful... I mean, it's a great... It's a wonderful industry to be in, and yeah. we all love it. But there are still frustrations. What is yeah. it that makes you I angry? totally agree with you. I mean, we all knock it, um, but we're in it. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm I'm so lucky. I'm doing a lifestyle job. I'm you know, being rewarded for it. And now with my travel photography, I'm kind of... It's, a, it's dreamland, uh, and I love it. Having said that, yep, it still frustrates me. It frustrates me, you know, when you know you see pictures on Instagram getting thousands of likes of very ordinary pictures. It, it frustrates me when you see you know documentary photography that is quite frankly poor, and the same with wedding photography. It's quite frankly poor, but it's because it might be from a certain person or it might be a certain style of image. You know, flash lit in the evening with a beautiful sunset. All those things go out the window and people look at, if you like, the image from a wow point rather than the technical point of view and don't realise how easy it is. And then you've got an image that is technically really good next to it or you can see a photographer's put a lot of thought into it. It's almost sort of swept aside and that's really frustrating. But I don't think there's anything you can do about it. We, you know, as photographers, we could just whinge about it yeah, to each yeah, yeah. other. And I'm sure every industry is the same. You know, no, I, I'm not sure that every industry think it is. is the same, do you? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Well, I came out of industry, so I did 10 years, possibly longer, working for a big corporate. And I've laughed about the photography industry ever since because when I worked in, in, the, in the sectors I did, I worked for media companies mostly, uh, but in IT and in business transformation, was those typically were very complicated industries, mm. complicated business models with very straightforward people that I was working with. Then I came out to the photography industry, and actually this is a very straightforward industry, but full of very complicated people. It was almost exactly <laughs> the opposite. 
And so I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I would lay a bet that, you know, the music industry probably is very similar or being an, you know, an artist is probably very similar. But Do you think it's because, I mean, music's probably a, a good analogy because, you know, musicians by their very nature that they're making something want to be heard. Yes. And if they're not being heard, they're disappointed and they're frustrated. And we as photographers, you know, we, we put our pictures on Instagram and we want likes because we want, you know, affirmation right. that we're good yeah, yeah, yeah. and if if you put an image up every day and it never got any likes yeah but the challenge of course and this is uh, musicians you'd be upset would, wouldn't you oh well, of course i'd be upset yeah. but of course the, the challenge you have and musicians definitely have this challenge you hear them you know over the years have talked about this is they want to be authentic they want to produce the music that they love and it comes from their heart mm. but that's not the same thing as producing music that the masses are going to react to if you want music the masses are going to react to, you better have a record deal that's going to get something played on Radio 1 in this country or whatever it is in the States. Um, and of course, how far people compromise um, to do that. You know, If you stick absolutely to your guns, you're always running the risk of not finding those likes and that affirmation. Mm. But you produce something that you love and it's mm. authentic. But I, I, I would say that it is similar within wedding photography because you know, wedding photography, you can be very successful and make a lot of money as in portrait photography but i mean i've just done my first shoot for national geographic you could you couldn't make a living out of working for national geographic you'd yeah. find it very hard and you know having uh, your images published in magazines you know it's kind of like you do the shoot in november um, the images are published in april may you'll then submit your invoice and then they pay 90 days yeah it's kind of like... You have to do a lot of it to yeah. make your money that way. And have a, a big backup to, to let this and the stuff sort of filter through. Whereas a wedding or a portrait, you know, they're paying you up front. A yeah. wedding is paying you up front sometimes six months a year ahead. Yeah. So... <laughs> money for... Was it art for art's sake? Money for art's yeah. sake? <laughs> How did it feel getting your stuff published in National Geographic? I saw, I saw you post some stuff about it. Um, it, was, it was amazing, really. I mean, it's kind of... Um, I think a dream for anyone who photographs, uh, you know, documentary photography, um, and uh, it's like everything. You know, these things it come about by pure luck. I mean, Neil from Nikon said, "Will you do a talk at National Geographic? Uh, will you do a talk at the National Geographic exhibition?" Yeah. And I said, "Yeah, of course." I said, "I can only do the ten o'clock slot." He said, "Because I said I've got a wedding in the afternoon." And he said, yep, so they fit me in and I get there and I set all up and and uh, the guy said, oh, by the way, he said, you've got, Chris is going to be looking after you. And um, so I met Chris and Chris said, like, anything you need in the day, just ask me. He says, I, I'm here, I'm your fixer, anything you want, just ask. Just I'm if you, here to make sure that you talk and yeah. it goes yeah. nice and smoothly. And... Um, we were talking, he even and got me a coffee and we, we, sit, we set up and we're just chatting away. And I said, quite, quite cheekily to, to him, I said, so I said, Chris, who, who hands the jobs out at National Geographic? And he, said, he says, I do. And I just thought, can't believe this guy just said this to me. Yeah. It's like, um, everyone here, I've got lucky, I've got the guy who dishes yeah. jobs out. And I said, oh, hello, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Shook his hand. And I said, um, I'd love to have a coffee with you. He said, yeah, yeah, he says, come on. And at the end of the show, he said, oh, he said, I'm really impressed with that. He said, and, and your images. Um, he said, here's my card. And then I went along and saw him. And uh, he, he said to me, he says, you know, he says, I'm not sure we can pay you the same as you get here. And, you know, he said, there's some things wrong with your images. He said, you know, you, you've got great uh, street photography, great storytelling, but, he said, from a National Geographic point of view, you haven't got the detail shots or the scene setting shots. Yeah. And that's because I don't take those sort of yeah. things. I don't think, oh, right, let's go and take the you know the little details on the street because yeah. I'm not interested in normally. But yeah. they want that, obviously, for their magazine because yeah. it brings the whole story together. So I said, well, it's no problem. I said, we can do those as course, Chris. And um, it went quiet. And nine months later, you know, I give a little call and he just said, there's nothing going yet and then like another six months later like this email just popped up in my inbox and just said oh see you're off to Kolkata um, do you fancy doing a shoot for us out there brilliant and uh, it took me all of like two seconds to decide on it <laughs> yes <laughs> and um, it's I mean I, I, 
I done the shoot. Um, you, I got a brief from them. You know, there was, yeah. you know, you need to go to this place, this place, this place. We want this shot, this shot. We want the same amount in portrait as in landscape. So there's kind of rules there. And if you need anything, you know, this is going to be the assigned writer for you. So you need to talk to her and liaise with her. So I did all that and I, I overloaded with images. I thought, you know, I really want you to have the best images I've got. Yeah. So I've been going to Kolkata five years now. So, you know, I just picked like 10 or 15 from each year and yeah. just plus what I'd done this year. Um, having said that, they didn't use any of the old images. They were all from this year um, and uh, published, did give me seven pages, wow. which is like, wow. Um, it's got to be every photographer's yeah. thing, I think, to be in something like National Geographic. And now it's gone the, the other way. So they've now phoned me up and said, can you let us know where you're going so we can piggyback on the back of it? And so That's amazing. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's dream, dream stuff. And so that's a proper tick in a, in a bucket list. Somewhere, we even had someone um, last week say, we saw your images in National Geographic. Um, are you interested in doing um, a private... Um, tuition in Myanmar for two days we work in Hong Kong wow we're like a shooters they said and, and I said yeah no problem at all so we're, we're talking to them about doing a two-day private workshop in Myanmar wow <laughs> but he's just picked up on that National Geographic yeah, yeah, yeah. thing so we're actually thinking on the website of doing push, pushing that more and just saying if you want one-to-one anywhere in the world yeah because it's not actually that expensive on you know it's the, it's the extra flights and you have to make your margins, but... It means, I mean, the Myanmar one would mean they only want a weekend. So it would mean me flying out on the Thursday. Um, and then, so it's like five or six days of my time, really. So there's a little bit more involved. But, you know, hey-ho. That'd be amazing. It's, t- it's tough. Uh, well, yes, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're sitting there saying it's tough with the biggest grin I I've know. seen on anyone I've interviewed, I think. Uh, what do your sons do? Um... I've got three boys. One's uh, in engineering um, and works in a foundry. Um, another one is uh, an engineer, works in a, in a plumbing company. And the middle one is the one with the creative bent, Johnny. Um, Johnny works at the moment for Nike. He heads up their retouching team. Right. Um, last year he was uh, Saatchi and Saatchi, heads up their retouching team. Um, it's retouching on a totally different level to anything yeah, yeah. we even could contemplate. He opened up an image for Nike recently for me, and it, it, um, there were um, I don't know what you'd call it. So there were there were fo- he had folders, yeah. and then within the folder were layers, and yeah. fo- each folder was for a specific part of the body, and there was like twenty folders, and each folder had a minimum of one hundred and seventy six layers in it. And there was one there where a T-shirt, you know, for, for an American footballer, um, every perforation he'd drawn in there, its own highlight and catch light in there. Amazing. So, I, yeah. I, I, one of my clients actually is, a, is, a, is an agency retoucher for uh, big brands and yeah. models. And yeah, he was talking to me about some of that stuff. And it's, I mean, some of the images he was talking about, there's one image in particular that he was working on where um, there it wasn't actually one image. It was dozens of mm. images. Um, e- even the staircase that the model was stood on was CGI. It was built in a 3D modeling package. Yeah. All of this bringing together. I mean, jo- Johnny gets a little bit, um, you know, on his high horse. Where he-, he actually thinks the photographer is less important than the retoucher. Um, as far as he's concerned, just give him an image with a bright, with a, with a woman with no makeup on and he'll put the makeup on her. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you want some clothes on her, like these footballers, they'll put um, a short sleeve shirt or a long sleeve shirt for different markets. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? And they draw the shirt in because they don't want the they don't want the shirts in production before they go on sale because they're so valuable um, that they they just show mock ups of it and then it's up to the retoucher to to draw it. And you've got access to someone in your family who's a high end retoucher, but you're. An authentic documentary photographer. The only thing Johnny did for me, and he helped me immensely, um, and it's actually it's, it's quite relevant. When I put my fellowship panel together, um, I did the retouching first, and then I showed it to Johnny, and Johnny said, "I'll just go over it and I'll I'll balance them." Yeah. Um, so if you when you go and see an exhibition, um, 
or you look in a book and a good book, all the photographs are balanced all the way through. There's yeah. that same, same color palette yeah. towards it. And quite often you know, when we're working in front of a computer, we work on one image then we yeah. look on the next one yeah. and they might be totally different. Yeah. Um, but he made sure he, he, he did that to all my images. It's a bit like color grading a film. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. But that's a nice thing to have access to. Yeah. I can imagine your, your, your Sunday dinners are quite lively. But I wouldn't ask him to retouch it. He'd just look at my work and just think, I mean, his own wedding images, he didn't retouch. He's like, that's what they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I'd, but with storytelling, I think, I mean, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to go down that particular rabbit hole of retouching. <laughs> I mean, I like retouching. I find it quite cathartic, actually. I, I, there's something about it that is almost as, for me, as enjoyable as taking a okay. photograph. I don't, I, I actually enjoy just me and the tablet and the screen and, just playing to be mm -hmm. honest um but of course it, you know with documentary photography you want that rawness and it's very easy to tip over the line mm. and it becomes too polished um but i just think it's really interesting that your middle son um not only is he in the industry but he's in a bit of the industry that typically you won't use <laughs> and he, he got the job through me chairing london portrait group oh really yeah oh, he, he, he went there as a as a um uh what's it called like a when he was at school his last year, like they give, yeah, work interior. placement, and they were they'd given him a job down the local garden centre or something, and he yeah. just said, "Dad, he says, can you get me selling in photography?" And I just met this guy called Mac at Tapestry, and I put the proposal to Mac and said, "Yeah, he says I'll give it a go." And um, I mean, it's a longer story, but the rest is history. That he got a job there, wow. and uh, yeah, he's he spent quite a few years there. Brilliant, um, and now he's. Heading up his own team. I'm going to say he must so, be pretty big. He's, pretty he's big. good, yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying he's good. I don't see a lot of his work, but just the fact that he's heading up Nike and Saatchi and yeah, Saatchi. Yeah. He's good. Kind of says. Yeah, <laughs> says you, it, just, it, yeah. you just know, don't you? <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you were talking to someone who's just starting out in, in our part of the industry, the, the creating the, the original image part of the industry, what single piece of advice would you give them? Gosh, that's a difficult one. Um, because I think it's such a competitive industry now to when, you know, I first entered. When I first entered, literally there was like a half dozen photographers like your Nigel Harpers and your Keith. And we knew each other and we spoke to each other all the time. And that and there were hardly any seminars on. But I'd say, what would I what would I do if I was entering now? I would say I'd go and second shoot probably with, with someone whose style you love. Um, I'd probably go and talk to one of the big associations and uh, seek out some, some people like some fellows who had attained those qualifications, not necessarily just people that were, um, you know, had a big social profile. I'd go and look for good quality training because I don't think, you know, you can beat that training. You know, you've got to learn, learn light, yeah. learn composition, and doesn't matter what style of photography you do, whether it be, you know, pure journalistic or your pure post or anything in between, you still need to know about light and composition and, and you, you'll go well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would agree on, on all of that. Uh, what's, we, we, I mean, we've, we've come to the, the wrapping up yes, part fine. Of, of, of the interview, but of course, as usual, it's nice to have some bits that just make me smile. Uh, so what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Gosh, I don't think I want to tell you really. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. <laughs> I never turned up at a wedding once. Oh, there we are. That's how? I just, for some unknown reason, I mean, bearing in mind I photographed 15, 1,500 weddings um, and I got a call from the venue to say, where are you? And I was about 20 miles away and they recommended me this venue did um, and, uh, and they still recommend me now. Wow. And... Uh, the chap there said, he said, oh, he said, he said, how quick can you get here? And I said, oh, 30 minutes or so. And he said, oh, leave it with me. And he went and told the bride, he said, oh, he said, uh, he said Mark's uh, parents have fallen ill. He's had to take them somewhere. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know that, of course. And I just got there. And because I walked in and said, I'm really, really sorry to the bride. She goes, no, she goes, I totally understand. She goes, we're really sorry. And they put the ceremony back 30 minutes. Wow. And I guess that's one of the benefits is because I knew everyone, yeah. and they they understood. And but uh, yeah, that was my biggest mistake. I want to say, not many photographers would admit to that. Not would they? many would admit to that. No, <laughs> it was I, a long, I, long time ago. 
Yes, and well, it was recovered, and it's a lesson recovered. Learned. And yeah, you know, we looked after the client afterwards. You know, we we made sure they had a special album, and um, but um, yeah, <laughs> we're all human after all. You know, these it, well, these things. Uh, happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually. I mean, I've, I as a wedding photographer, I try really hard to work locally, so within twenty miles, if mm-hmm. I can. I said when I started out, you know, I wanted to be an international destination wedding photographer like and then yeah. <laughs> and then you start to do that and realize it's it's a lot of work a lot of logistics and high risk and then so i brought that inside the uk mm-hmm. and nationwide uk and then you start to realize you spend a lot of time in premier inns and a lot of time traveling and also if it's just on the edge of that where you can't really justify an overnight i would sit in the car for an hour and a half terrified as i'm heading over there in case you know a motorway clogged up and i've got sat navs and and so now i i really like my wedding venues to be Nice and within this area, if I can. I still do some destination stuff, but it's not something we push. No, I, I don't do any... Well, I've got one destination wedding this year. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't I don't push for them. I think they're more, they're more difficult than you think. Um, you don't know the, the location. You don't know the people. Um, you can't really recce the place before. Yeah. There's so many things that can go wrong. Um, that I, it's not worth it. And then also, you know, you're away for such a long period. You know, you, you're away for three or four days yeah. minimum yeah. and you could have done three or four jobs. Yeah. And, and very few couples are in a position to remunerate you correctly for those Correct. three, four or yeah. five days. Um, and that, that, I mean, they, they are out there and yeah. I know some very good... And we always say, you know, now it's like, you know, if we're going out there... Um, the the we we only fly economy plus. So we've got a bigger chair. We've got to, you've got to include um, ba- excess baggage in there. Yeah. You know we want taxi f- to and from the airport. We want all our reasonable expenses are paid. Just like you work for, if you work for a company, you would get that anyway. Yeah. So why shouldn't you as a photographer? Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree just, with you. Just going back to the, the the problem thing. You know nowadays with digital, there should never ever be issues really because you know we shoot to two cards and yep. we've got backups yep. etc. You know, go back in the day when we were filmed, and it used to frighten the hell out of me <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, yeah. you know, you'd have this roll of film that you had to send in the post um, to a lab, um, and then they'd send it back to you. And then when a client ordered a reprint, yeah. you had to then take that negative yeah. and send it off again, yeah. and it was sent back. And and then there was only one copy of any, every yeah. anything. So um, it's amazing that... Yeah. Well, I t- I'll tell you a funny story about my mum's graduation picture. So that she, when I went to school... Uh, my mum had left university early um, to have me. And so when I was old enough, she went back to college. And her graduation pictures from uh, her, she got a teaching degree. They were sent in the post with the negatives. The dog chewed them. They came in through the front door and the dog savaged the lot. I think there was one print uh, that survived, uh, but everything else was completely, utterly mullered. And there's no going back. Uh, we have it in some senses a little bit easier today. Well, it, 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 I say easier. That's probably not the right term, but it, it actually frustrates me when you see on social media that someone has lost their images or they yeah. because they, they, really there should be no excuse these days. You know, we have two copies, we have two cameras. Yeah, um, but it's an interesting. De- it was an interesting decision by Nikon to release the Z6 and Z7 with single cards. Yeah, and I think they suffered from it. Well, I, I looked at that as well. I'm not. I was looking to go mirrorless, and I will wait until they put two cards yeah. in their cameras. Um, I think that was a big mistake. Uh, final proper question is if there's one book you would recommend a photographer had on a bookshelf. We have bookshelves. Of it, but I'm not very digital in that sense. I like a bookshelf full of books. Um, you're talking to an avid collector of books. Here. That's great. Give me two. Um, I've got a huge, uh, probably over a thousand books, I think. Um, I'm sure, didn't you see them when you came to the house? I did, but I didn't look through them. I think I was more fascinated by your record player and music collection, okay. actually, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, so if I was going to say two books um, that I... Two or three, I'm going to give you three, actually. I mean, the first one is um, is uh, called Contact Sheet by Magnum. I've got that one. And the reason I love it is because it shows you as a photographer what that photographer's sequence of thoughts were to get to the best shot. Yeah. Um, and it's really eye-opening. You can actually see how they work that image, which is what we still try to say yeah. to people today, work, work, the, work, the, work the image or work the, 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 the situation. Um, there's another book I love is by Sam Abel. And I think it's called Two Worlds. 
And the reason, again, I love it is because it has two pictures across a spread, double page spread, of the same scenario. And it's got one image uh, on the left, just showing you like the scenario, if you like a wide angle shot of it. And then, it's, then the second picture on the right is the picture that he took. And there's, you go through everywhere and it, it, it shows you that if you look, there's an image somewhere that you might not see. And one of his most famous Im images with, uh, um, it's, I think it's in the Midwest with some cowboys um, skinning or uh, some, some cows yeah. or whatever. And you just see a big scenario and it doesn't look anything at all. But then when he crops in or gets in there close, it's probably one of the best layered storytelling images that you can kind of see. Yeah. So they're, they're without doubt probably my two, say, I go to books. Uh, my favorite photographer um, is uh, Larry Bartlett. Uh, Magnum photographer, right. and I just love all his books. I love his storytelling. Um, but uh, yeah, any books really on documentary photography, I love. So have you got a title for a book from him? Um, I put for... I put these on the links on the podcast. Okay. Um, and also, I go and buy one. Okay. So I go and hunt one down secondhand. Uh, so I'm collecting books upstairs, which I love, and it's a great opportunity. <laughs> this is a genuine, genuine interest. This is going to cost you a lot of money. Well, the second hand, <laughs> the second hand market's not that bad. I mean, there was one the other day where second hand they were fifty quid, and I did kind of. No, no I, I've, um, I've got some books. I mean, I've got, uh, bought a book um, called Extravaganza by Jason Ekinazi. He's a, he's a, um, a Magnum photographer, and I bought this book like I don't know, ten years ago, and it's small. I mean, yeah. six by four yeah. photographs in it. Yeah. And it's obviously kind of handmade-ish because yeah. it's got like a thick bit of card on the book. Yeah. And I paid 20 quid for that. It's probably worth a fortune. 800 pounds. Oh, ouch. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. And then the other one that I've got like that is by Trent Park. Um, it's an Australian magnum photographer. And he produced a book called Dream Life, which is, you know, a really good book. And he produced, I think they produced like a couple of thousand copies. Yeah. And they were stored in his studio, and his studio flooded. Like ninety percent of them were damaged. And I'd bought one signed before that point. And again, you know, it's kind of yeah, serendipity. That's worth a fortune too. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> th th that's that's kind of you get lucky with that. Yeah. You don't buy them for that. No, and I'm just I'm just enjoying the fact that um, I bought one the other day, and I think it cost me more for the postage than the book. Yeah, in fact, I've um, when you edit it. It's Larry Towell. I don't know why I said Bartlett. I was thinking of someone else. T O W E W L. Um, and uh, he's um, quite a unique photographer from the Midwest. He's a Magnum guy. He's done quite a few books, but my, my favourite book is From My f uh, Porch Door, I think it's called. Um, but he's got a book on Afghanistan. Um, Pop over, you could have a look at the few of them anytime you like, Paul. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll put links in those, and if I can find them yeah. with secondhand, you know, Amazon's pretty good because it has lots of resellers or secondhand booksellers on their books. The other good place so, to get books is have you heard of Abe? No. Abe Books, A, A B E. It's probably better than Amazon because okay. it specializes in, in books, and okay. you'll generally see a bigger set of collection, and they come from either as Abe UK and Abe. Okay. Dot com, which I should is put in, the yeah, links. Abe is very good. I should put the links on the footnotes to the blog. And then just in closing, um, just give a very quick pitch for your uh, travel documentary Thank you. street photography courses. Because they're, they're well worth it. I know that because I've talked to people who've been on them uh, and I've seen the photography that comes off them too. So We've been running them for five years now. Um, initially, we were doing them through Nikon and now we're kind of just doing them by ourselves. Um, but uh, they're all almost always off the beaten track. Uh, they're small groups of photographers, typically five, six people. Um, we don't go out as a group. We split up on the day. So in the morning, it'd be me and you. And then yeah. in the afternoon, you'd go with one of the other photographers and we'd kind of swap around yeah. like that. And that gives a lot of benefits in that, you know, you get to see how other people yeah. work. Yeah. And also it just means you get, you know, good sort of, camaraderie going within the group and everyone's sort of talking and buzzing with each other 
And then each evening we um, we all sit down and I critique everyone's work. So, um, I mean, I've been on photography courses where the tutor, you know, will come out with you and then he'll go and stay in his own hotel room and then see you the next morning. Yeah. You know, I don't believe in doing that. Yeah. I'm with you for breakfast and I'm with you for dinner and yeah. I'm with you pretty yeah. much for 10, 12 hours per day. I, I'm generally with you when you're photographing and it's quite interesting. Andy Mack uh, come on a couple of courses with me and he pointed out, he said, I like the way you you teach in that you don't actually take a picture then go, look at the back of my camera, look, look at that. He said, you normally say, look at that scenario over there. Can you see that shape there? And can you, if you shot through that, why don't you go and do it? So, because particularly on a street, if you take it and show it, it's gone. Yeah. Um, so it, a lot of people say to me, you know, why should I come? I can just spend that money and, and do it myself. But you get all those things, you get, you know, you get, uh, you get just some brilliant advice the whole week and you'll come away with some amazing pictures and amazing experience um, and probably a new set of uh, amazing friends. Brilliant. What a good pitch. Uh, you've got me. <laughs> I need to go and talk to accounts. It's gone up upstairs. double now. <laughs> yeah, cheers, Mark. Thanks very much. Uh, what an absolute pleasure and a real genuine privilege, and I mean that, to have you sitting here in our studio chatting about Thank all you. of this stuff. No, it's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, and I hope you enjoy listening to it on the playback. So what an absolute pleasure it was for me to interview Mark Seymour. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do subscribe that way. As soon as we publish a new one, of course, it pops straight into your intro and you get to listen to it while the paint is still fresh. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes. You can subscribe on Spotify. We're on our Podbean. We're on Radio Public. We're on Stitcher. Uh, each of those apps allows you to subscribe to us. Alternatively, you can see the full archive of our podcasts across on Mastering Portrait Photography, where, of course, you will also find our latest videos. Uh, I've just started a new series on Photoshop Shorts, uh, which are going to be short segments of things you can do in Photoshop. I think the first one is on Actions. Uh, I'm about to publish the latest critique as well. Uh, we would love you to leave us a review of the podcast. Please do that on iTunes. It's easy to do. You go across to the iTunes app. Uh, you find us. Uh, just search for Mastering Portrait Photography. You will find this podcast. Hit leave a review or leave a rating. We'd love to have some words from you. Please do actually write something down, even if it's just to say you like it or there's some things we could do that would improve it. Obviously, if you're going to do that, I'd rather you emailed me, but I don't mind because it's all good. It means that we're pushing the podcast forwards uh, and trying out different things. Also, leave us a a star rating because the higher the rating the easier it is for people to find us in their search results so until next time have a wonderful week please do enjoy what sunshine you have and remember be kind to yourself take care
a wonderful guy, wonderful stories, a wonderful opportunity for me to spend some time talking with someone who truly inspires me. I will put the links to the books that Mark mentions and to his street photography courses into the podcast text below. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I really do hope uh, that you have, then please do subscribe. Uh, we can be found on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, and numerous others, Radio Public and numerous others, or numerous other podcast channels out there. And we'd love you, we'd love you to leave us a review and a rating. Please do that on iTunes. We're easy enough to find. Just search for Mastering Portrait Photography uh, and you'll very quickly find the podcast. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And of course, all of those ratings and reviews help us climb the search rankings. Uh, please head across to the MasteringPortraitPhotography.com website. Uh, we're in the process of publishing a whole load of new stuff. Uh, I've just started a series of uh, Photoshop shorts, uh, the first one being how to record an action. Uh, and over the pa next couple of days, I'll also publish uh, the latest and greatest uh, image critique. Uh, so until next time, uh, remember, be kind to yourself. Take care. <laughs>